and let me kill the rest of those guys to turn me into a serial killer. When we talk about serial killers, we often envision a male figure with a knife in hand. But let's delve deeper into the dark corners of history where women take center stage in grim scenarios. Imagine calculating, skillfully concealing their crimes, women whose actions send shivers down our spines. Yes, friends, today we peer into the abyss where female evil proves to be just as chilling and dangerous as its male counterpart. Are you ready for a shocking immersion into the world of terrifying female serial killers? Leonardo Cianciulli. Leonardo Cianciulli was born in 1894 in a small Italian town. Her life began ordinarily, but fate had charted an extraordinary path for her. In her youth, Leonardo met a man whom she fell in love with. However, her parents forbade their relationship and she was forced to marry another man. Once, according to her, a gypsy predicted to her that she would become a widow, but also promised that she would become the most famous woman in Italy. This prediction became a key, opening doors to a dark future. After the death of her first husband, Leonardo met her second man, but her second husband disappeared without a trace, leaving her a widow with two children. During this time, Leonardo began to practice magic and extrasensory abilities. She claimed to have received instructions from the goddess of love on how to achieve success and wealth. However, these instructions were terrifying and cruel. She killed women and turned their bodies into soap, which she then sold at the market. Leonardo's first victim was Faustina Setti, who sought her help in finding a husband. Leonardo lured Faustina with the promise of a suitable partner in Pola. On the day of Faustina's departure, she visited Leonardo one last time. Leonardo killed Faustina with an axe and dragged her body into a closet. Leonardo threw the dismembered pieces into a pot, adding seven kilos of caustic soda that she had purchased to make soap. Leonardo stirred the mixture until the pieces dissolved, creating a thick, dark mush. She took the coagulated blood from the basin, dried it in the oven, and ground it into a powder. Mixing it with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk, eggs, and a margarine, she created a concoction. Leonardo baked these ingredients into tea cakes, which she served to visitors. Leonardo's second victim was Francesca Suavi, whom she promised a job at a school for girls in Piacenza. Leonardo convinced Francesca to write postcards to her friends and family, detailing her plans. On September 5, 1940, Francesca visited Leonardo for the last time. Her body met the same fate as Faustina's, dissolved in caustic soda. But it was Leonardo's third and final victim, Virginia Cazioppo, who experienced an even more gruesome fate. Leonardo claimed to have found Virginia work as a secretary for a mysterious impression in Florence. On September 30th, 1940, Virginia visited Leonardo for a final visit. From her victims, Leonardo also gained their possessions. She reportedly received large sums of money, including 30,000 lire from Faustina Setti and 50,000 lire assorted jewels and public bonds from Virginia Cassiopo. Leonardo even sold the victim's clothing and shoes, further profiting from her heinous crimes. Her cruel crimes were uncovered in 1940, and Leonardo was sentenced to life imprisonment. Today, Leonardo Cianciulli remains one of the most mysterious and terrifying criminal figures. What drove this woman to commit such cruel actions? We may never know the answer to this question. Carla Homolka Will Carla Homolka's motives become clearer? Known as one of the most terrifying female serial killers in history, Homolka's heinous acts of violence shocked the world. Alongside her husband, Paul Bernardo, she embarked on a chilling spree of abduction, rape, and murder that targeted young girls. Homolka's crimes were marked by sadistic brutality. After serving her sentence, Homolka was released from prison in 2005 and settled in Quebec, where she married and had children. The story begins in the late 1980s in Scarborough, Ontario, Canada. Carla Homolka, an ordinary young woman, crossed paths with Paul Bernardo. Little did anyone know that their twisted attraction would lead to a series of unimaginable horrors. Behind closed doors in her early life, she experienced violence and intimidation from her strict father. Bernardo, on the other hand, grew up in a dysfunctional household with a controlling and abusive father and a depressed mother. The couple's first victim was none other than Homolka's own sister, Tammy. They drugged and assaulted Tammy, leading to her tragic death. To cover up their heinous crime, they staged Tammy's demise as an accident. This would be the first of many acts of their unspeakable violence. Homolka and Bernardo, targeted young girls, abducting them, subjecting them to unimaginable horrors, and ultimately ending their lives in the most gruesome manner. Their sadistic acts also involved sexual assault and torture. 
One survivor, Jane Doe, managed to escape their clutches, providing a glimpse into the horrifying reality. But sadly, many others were not as fortunate. Leslie Mahaffey, a young girl, also fell victim to the couple's insatiable bloodlust. Her life was taken, and her body was callously disposed of in cement blocks in a nearby lake. The couple's spree of violence continued with the abduction, sexual assault, and murder. Kristen French. The details of their crimes are too disturbing to recount in full, but suffice it to say that their actions were marked by a complete disregard for human life. Despite being investigated by the police, Homolka and Bernardo managed to evade suspicion for a time. However, in 1990, a sketch of the Scarborough rapist, believed to be Bernardo, was released. The police interviewed Bernardo twice, but failed to make an arrest. It wasn't until DNA evidence linked him to the crimes that the truth began to unravel. Before Bernardo could be apprehended, he confessed to Homolka about committing more crimes. Unbeknownst to him, Homolka had already confessed to her aunt and uncle, leading to her arrest. She cooperated with the authorities and revealed the existence of videotapes documenting their acts. Bernardo was subsequently arrested, and a thorough search of their home uncovered the horrifying truth. The crimes committed by Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo were nothing short of a nightmare. Their reign of terror left a trail of devastation and shattered lives in their wake. In conclusion, the chilling tale of Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo serves as a haunting reminder of the depths of human depravity. Anna Maria Zwanziger Similarly, Anna Maria was also prone to vice. Anna Maria Zwanziger, known as the German Breen Villiers, was an 18th century Bavarian serial killer. Orphaned at five, she endured a tumultuous upbringing, saved by a guardian who provided education and introduced her to literature. Forced into marriage at 15 to a much older man, their union was unhappy, leading Anna to prostitution to support her family. After her husband's death, she worked for the judge when she realized she could gain some power by poisoning his wife. Working as Gleiser's housekeeper and cook, Anna orchestrated the reconciliation between Glaser and his wife, using her culinary skills to poison the wife with significant amounts of arsenic. The effects of the poison were agonizing, and Mrs. Glazer suffered an excruciating death within just three days. But Anna's thirst for power and control didn't stop there. She moved on to her next victim, Judge Groman. This time, her motive seemed to be fueled by jealousy. When Groman announced his engagement to another woman, Anna saw it as a personal affront. In a fit of rage, she poisoned and his tea, resulting in his excruciating death. Her final victim, Frau Gebhard, the wife of Justice Gebhard, fell prey to Anna's deadly intentions. Anna, once again, used arsenic to end the life of another innocent victim. Frau Gebhard's health declined rapidly. Unfortunately, her claims that the new nurse, Anna, had been poisoning her were dismissed and she too passed away. But Anna's reign of terror didn't stop at her direct victims. In a poison-fueled rage, she targeted anyone who entered the Gebhard household. She poisoned the servants, individuals who despised her, and even the innocent baby of the household. Anna laced the coffee, salt, and sugar jars with large amounts of arsenic, ensuring that anyone who consumed these everyday items would fall victim to her deadly plot. The aftermath of the mass poisoning sent shockwaves through the community, and suspicion began to fall on Anna. The authorities wanted to question her, but she had disappeared, moving from place to place in search of a new life. However, the law was determined to bring her to justice. In October 1809, in Nuremberg, she was found carrying an arsenic package in her pocket, yet she persisted in denying everything, even attempting to place the blame for Judge Glazer's wife's death on the judge himself. However, during her trial, Anna's true nature was revealed. She yelled in court, confessing to killing everyone and expressing her desire to continue poisoning men, women, and children without regard for their gender. Her motivations were rooted in her detestation of the well-being and joy of others, a stark contrast to her own worn-out appearance. Ultimately, Anna Zwanziger was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. She died without repentance, bidding farewell to the sheriff and executioner with a courteous bow on the scaffold. Maria Swanenberg. No less horrific is the story of Maria Swanenberg, which began on September 9, 1839, in the city of Leiden, Netherlands. She was born into a poor family with many children, some of whom tragically died young from cholera. Growing up, Maria lived in a small worker's cottage with her 11 family members, and the living conditions were harsh. At the age of 28, Maria married the father of her children. Tragedy struck Maria's life when two of her children died shortly after their marriage. She developed a drinking problem. It was during this time that she she began her sinister path of poisoning people. Maria Swanenberg's motive for her heinous crimes was primarily financial gain. She sought to benefit from life insurance policies 
and inheritance money, using her victims' deaths to secure her own financial stability. However, her choice of victims was not solely driven by financial motives. Maria's method of killing was through the use of various substances, including arsenic, lead, and strychnine. She would add these deadly substances to the food and drinks of her victims. When ingested, they caused severe symptoms such as diarrhea, dehydration, and organ damage. The victims would experience agonizing headaches, light sensitivity, and ultimately, heart and kidney failure. Her victims were unsuspecting neighbors, friends, and even family members. Also, there were instances where her crimes seemed driven by a compulsion to kill. In one chilling incident, she even attempted to poison six people, including the pregnant mother of two sisters she had murdered while babysitting. The investigation into Maria Swannenberg's crimes began when Hendrik Frankhuysen sought medical help after experiencing excruciating pain. His wife and newborn son had already succumbed to a mysterious illness characterized by diarrhea and vomiting. The deaths of mother and child were not uncommon in the neighborhood where cholera outbreaks were frequent. However, Vijnand Rutger's van der Loef, a doctor who had treated another patient with similar symptoms on the same street, grew suspicious. As the investigation unfolded, Maria Swannenberg, also known as Good Me, emerged as a primary suspect. Neighbors came forward with stories of families she had been involved with, whose members had died one after another. The evidence against her was damning, and she was eventually convicted of murdering 23 people. However, it is believed that her actual victim count may have been much higher, with estimates reaching over 100. The laws regulating the sale of arsenic were amended, and there were calls to reinstate the death penalty specifically for her case. However, due to her gender, she was sentenced to life in prison. Instead, she spent the remaining years of her life behind bars, eventually passing away in 1915. The aftermath of Maria Swannenberg's crimes highlighted the need for better oversight and protection against such acts of serial poisoning. It also raised questions about the social conditions that may have contributed to her actions. Helene Gigado as you might have understood, many murderers' stories originate from a difficult childhood. Helene Gigado, the terrifying female serial killer, was a French domestic servant who terrorized the people of Brittany in the 19th century. Born in 1803, Gigado's early life was marked by tragedy and loss. Over the course of 18 years, Gigado is believed to have murdered as many as 36 people using the deadly poison arsenic. Her victims ranged from family members to unsuspecting employers. Following her mother's death, Helene was sent to live with her aunts, who worked as servants at the rectory of Bubri. It was here that she was introduced to the world of domestic service, a world that would become both her livelihood and her hunting ground. At the age of 17, Helen went to the town of Seglian, where she got a job as a cook. It was during her time she was accused of adding hemp from the curé's grain house to his soup, an act that hinted at a darker side to her nature. However, it wouldn't be until 1833 that Helen's first suspected poisoning occurred. At the time, she was employed by another priest, Faster Francois Le Drogo, in the nearby village. Over the course of three months, a series of sudden deaths plagued the household, claiming the lives of seven individuals, including the priest himself and even Helene's own visiting sister, Anne Gigado. Despite the number of deaths, Helene's apparent sorrow and pious behavior allowing her to continue her activities undetected. Returning to Bubri, Helene found herself caring for three individuals, including her other aunt, who passed away within a span of three months. This pattern of death followed Helene as she relocated to Lochminé, where she boarded with a needleworker, Marie-Jeanne Le Boucher. Both Marie-Jeanne and her daughter fell victim to her lethal actions, while her son, who refused Helene's ministrations, managed to survive. The same town became the setting for yet another death when the widow Loret offered Helene a room. By May 1835, Helene had been hired by Madame Toussaint, where four more deaths swiftly followed. Throughout her murderous spree, Helene's victims displayed symptoms consistent with arsenic poisoning. However, despite the mounting death toll, she was never caught with arsenic in her possession. The reign of terror came to a dramatic end with her arrest in 1851, marking the beginning of a trial that would captivate the public's attention. During the trial, Helene's behavior was erratic and unpredictable. The prosecution presented a compelling case linking Helene to 23 suspected deaths by poisoning between 1833 and 1841. Ultimately, the court found Helene Gigado guilty of three murders, three attempted murders, and 11 counts of theft. Due to French laws regarding permissible evidence and the statute of limitations, the charges were limited to those within the specified time frame. On February 26, 1852, Helene Gigado faced her ultimate fate. Sentenced to death by guillotine, she was executed in front of a large crowd of onlookers on the Champ de Mars in Rennes. Jane Topin. 
Our next girl on the list has an equally captivating story. Jane Topan, also known as Jolly Jane, was a terrifying female serial killer who unleashed a reign of terror in Massachusetts between 1895 and 1901. As a nurse, she exploited her position to harm patients and their families, driven by sexual fetishes, sadism, and jealousy. She derived perverse pleasure from patients' vulnerability and enjoyed administering lethal doses of drugs. Her motives extended to personal vendettas and gaining attention from men. She also used poison to incapacitate a housekeeper to steal her job and later kill the family she worked for. Toppen's killing spree began in earnest in 1895, when she poisoned her landlord, Israel Dunham, and his wife. This marked the beginning of a horrifying pattern that would continue for several years. In 1899, she targeted her foster sister, Elizabeth Brigham, administering a lethal dose of strychnine. The following year, she claimed the lives of Mary McNear, a patient, and Florence Calkins, the housekeeper for Elizabeth. In 1901, Toppen moved in with the elderly Alden Davis and his family in Catamet, ostensibly to care for Mr. Davis after the death of his wife, Matty. Within weeks of her arrival, she embarked on a spree of murder, taking the lives of Davis, his sister Edna Bannister, and two of his daughters, Minnie and Genevieve. The surviving members of the Davis family became suspicious after the death of Minnie and ordered a toxicology exam, which confirmed their worst fears. She had been poisoned. Local authorities assigned a police detail to watch Toppen closely. On October 29, 1901, she was arrested for murder, and the true extent of her crimes began to unravel. During her trial, Toppen shocked the courtroom by confessing to a staggering 31 murders. Her victims ranged from patients under her care to innocent family members. Toppen's methods of murder were as chilling as they were calculated. She would administer lethal doses of drugs, such as morphine and atropine, to her victims, often altering their prescribed dosages to ensure a swift and deadly outcome. She would then spend time alone with her victims, making up faker charts and medicating them to drift in and out of consciousness. Toppen also would engage in intimate acts with her victims as they lay dying, deriving a perverse pleasure from their vulnerability and suffering. This level of sadistic manipulation and control added an even darker dimension to her crimes. She targeted individuals within her personal sphere as well, such as her foster sister and the Davis family. This demonstrates a chilling ability to blend into society, gaining the trust of those around her before betraying it in the most horrific way imaginable. In 1902, Toppen's trial concluded with a shocking verdict. Despite her insistence on her own sanity, she was declared insane and committed for life to the Taunton Insane Hospital. She spent the remainder of her days there, finally passing away on August 17, 1938, at the age of 84. Daria Saltikova in Russian history, there are also insane characters. Daria Saltikova, commonly known as Saltichika, was born on November 3, 1730, into a wealthy Russian family in Moscow. She grew up in a privileged environment surrounded by the opulence and grandeur of the classical era. Daria's family was well connected to several other noble families, and at a young age, she married into the famous Saltikov family. Her husband's name was Gleb Saltikov, and together they embarked on a life of wealth and privilege. However, Daria's husband passed away, leaving her a young widow at the age of 26. With her husband's death, Daria inherited a substantial estate, which included a mansion called Troitskoy. This estate was not only a symbol of her wealth, but also housed a substantial number of serfs, numbering over 600. Daria was a deeply pious woman who donated a significant portion of her wealth to charities and monasteries. Her acts of charity and devotion to the church earned her a reputation as a devout and generous noblewoman. But beneath this facade of piety, a darkness lurked within her. One day, as Daria was feeling increasingly lonely, she encountered a young and handsome man named Nikolai Tyuchev. The affair that ensued brought a newfound sense of joy into her life. However, her happiness was short-lived when she discovered that Tyuchev was involved in a love affair with a young girl. Daria unleashed her fury upon her female serfs, viewing them as rivals. The younger they were, the more she despised them. She subjected them to unimaginable torture and cruelty, often resulting in their deaths. She would beat them mercilessly, break their bones, throw them out of the house naked into the freezing cold and pour boiling water on their bodies. Pregnant women and children were not spared from her sadistic acts. 
Despite the mounting complaints and rumors surrounding the deaths at the Saltikova estate, authorities turned a blind eye. Daria's connections with powerful members of the royal court shielded her from any consequences. It wasn't until the relatives of the murdered women took matters into their own hands and brought a petition before Empress Catherine II that justice began to unfold. Catherine decided to publicly try Daria Saltikova, exposing her crimes to the world. In 1762, Daria was arrested after a six-year investigation, revealing she had murdered at least 139 people, mainly women and young girls aged 10 to 12, over six to seven years. In 1768, she was found guilty of killing 38 female serfs and sentenced to life imprisonment due to the abolition of the death penalty in Russia. A civil execution ceremony was held on Red Square in Moscow, serving as a warning to others. She spent the rest of her life in isolation in a windowless wooden cell in Ivanovsky Convent in Moscow, where her crimes were hidden away, but her reign of terror would forever haunt those who heard her name. Elizabeth Bathory The next woman was also dazzled and encouraged by power and wealth. Elizabeth Bathory, the infamous blood countess, was born Erzabet Bathory on August 7, 1560, in Nierbator, a town in the Kingdom of Hungary. She was born into one of the most prominent families in Central Europe, and as a result, she was lavished with the very best education and a classic upbringing. However, Elizabeth's early life was not without its challenges. She suffered from severe health problems, her weak constitution led to her being an epileptic, prone to violent seizures. Despite her health issues, Elizabeth's upbringing exposed her to a world of violence and horror. It is said that during her childhood, she was not repulsed by the violence she witnessed. Instead, she seemed to be drawn to it. One particularly disturbing incident involved a man who had committed the crime of stealing being sewn into the body of a horse. Rather than being repulsed, young Elizabeth reportedly laughed at the sight. At the age of 10, she had become a stunningly beautiful young lady. It was during this time that she became engaged to Ferenc Nadaski, a 15-year-old Hungarian count. Elizabeth moved into her future husband's parents' palace and received an education in running the estates under the guidance of her mother-in-law. On May 8, 1574, at the age of 14, Elizabeth married Ferenc Nadaski. But during this time, Elizabeth was sexually active during her marriage. As a gift, Ferenc bestowed upon his young bride a castle of her own, Castle Cactis, where she would later commit her most horrific crimes. The union of Elizabeth and Ferenc united two ultra-powerful families, making them the power couple of their time. However, their marriage was not one of conventional love and affection. Instead, they bonded over their shared love for violence and sadism. Ferenc taught Elizabeth innovative methods of torture, such as using oiled paper rolled up and placed between the toes of a servant girl, which would then be set on fire. He even gifted her a clawed glove to scratch the faces of disobedient servant girls. While Ferenc introduced Elizabeth to the world of sadism and violence, another evil influence entered their household in 1601. Anna d'Avolia, a woman rumored to be a witch, joined the household and had a profound impact on Elizabeth's personality. Under Anna's sinister tutelage, Elizabeth's sadistic tendencies intensified, and she began to take the lives of several of her servants. While the exact number of her victims remains a subject of debate, the shocking nature of her crimes has made her a legend. The court ultimately condemned Elizabeth Bathory to a life of solitary confinement in her own castle, where she was walled in a set of rooms until her death four years later. Her accomplices were punished with execution or life sentences, but the Blood Countess herself escaped the executioner's acts due to her noble status. Juana Barraza But for Juana, escaping her fate completely was not possible. Juana Barraza's early life was marked by tragedy and hardship, setting the stage for the dark path she would eventually embark upon. Born on December 27, 1957, in Epazoyucan, Hidalgo, Mexico, Juana grew up in a dysfunctional family plagued by alcoholism and abuse. Her mother, Justa Samperio, was an alcoholic who exchanged her young daughter for three beers to a man who repeatedly raped her. The trauma inflicted upon Juana at such a tender age would leave lasting scars on her psyche. Juana's childhood was further marred by the loss of her older brother, Jose Enrique, who was tragically killed in a mugging. Despite these hardships, Juana persevered and sought solace in the world of wrestling. Prior to her descent into darkness, Juana found an outlet for her emotions and a sense of empowerment in the wrestling ring. 
Under the ring name La Dama del Silencio, or The Lady of Silence, she became a professional wrestler, captivating audiences with her strength and skill. However, Juana's troubled past and the abuse she endured at the hands of her mother fueled a growing resentment towards women, particularly the elderly. As Juana's wrestling career flourished, her sinister side began to emerge. Outside the ring, she would transform into a cold-blooded killer, targeting vulnerable elderly women who lived alone. Her victims, all women aged 60 or over, became the unfortunate targets of her rage and twisted sense of justice. Juana's modus operandi was chillingly calculated. Posing as a government official, she would gain the trust of her victims by offering them the opportunity to sign up for welfare programs. Armed with a stethoscope and a fake ID card, she would enter their homes under the guise of providing assistance. Once inside, Juana would unleash her brutality, bludgeoning or strangling her victims before robbing them of their belongings. The authorities and the press were initially baffled by the string of murders, dismissing the possibility of a female serial killer. However, as the evidence mounted, it became clear that Juana Barraza was the mastermind behind these heinous crimes. Her physical appearance, described as masculine and imposing, further confounded investigators who initially believed the killer to be a man. In November 2005, the Mexican authorities began to piece together the puzzle, as witness statements indicated that the killer wore women's clothing to gain access to the victim's apartment. Apartments. A breakthrough in the case came on January 25, 2006, when Juana was apprehended while fleeing from the home of her latest victim, Ana Maria de los Reyes Alfaro. The arrest of Juana Barraza sent shockwaves through the nation, challenging preconceived notions of who could be a serial killer. On March 31, 2008, Juana Barraza was sentenced to 759 years in prison for her crimes, a sentence that underscored the severity of her actions and brought a measure of closure to a terrified public. Miyuki Ishikawa more fragile, yet no less horrific, girl Miyuki, on the contrary, chose infants as her victims instead of the elderly. Miyuki Ishikawa, born on February 5, 1897, in the village of Honjo in Miyazaki Prefecture, had a seemingly ordinary upbringing. Growing up in a small village, she was raised in a modest family with traditional values. In 1914, at the age of 17, Miyuki made a life-changing decision and moved to Tokyo. In Tokyo, she dedicated herself to her studies and graduated as a certified midwife on September 30, 1919. This achievement marked the beginning of her career in the field of healthcare. That same year, Miyuki married Takeshi Ishikawa, a man three years her senior. Their marriage, unfortunately, did not result in any biological children due to Miyuki's previous hysterectomy. Miyuki managed a maternity home called Kotobuki San Inn, which became a prominent institution in Tokyo. Miyuki's experience and skills as a midwife allowed her to hold important positions in multiple midwives' associations, further solidifying her status in the community. It was during the late 1940s, in the aftermath of World War II, that the dark side of Miyuki's character began to emerge. Many babies were brought to Kotobuki San In during this period, most of them born out of wedlock. The real mothers of these infants were often too impoverished to provide proper care and support. This unfortunate circumstance led to a decrease in the number of foster parents available, leaving Miyuki with a difficult decision to make. Instead of providing the necessary care and attention, these innocent lives deserved, Miyuki chose to neglect the infants under her care. Tragically, many of these neglected babies died as a direct result of her actions. The other midwives employed at Kotobuki Sanin were appalled by Miyuki's practices and could no longer bear to be associated with such cruelty. One by one, they resigned from their positions, leaving Miyuki to carry out her sinister deeds alone. At the same time, Isikawa tried to be paid for these killings. She and Takeshi extorted large sums of money from parents, arguing that the costs of raising their unwanted children would be lower than the money demanded. Dr. Shiro Nakayama was also involved in this scheme and aided the couple by forging death certificates. In total, it is known that 201 infants became her victims. Two police officers found the remains of five victims of Ishikawa on January 12, 1948. Ishikawa and her husband were arrested three days later. Further investigation uncovered the ashes of over 40 infants in a mortician's house and 30 more in a temple. Prosecutors claimed the couple murdered at least 27 infants out of 84 deaths from April 1946 to January 1948. On October 11, 1948, the Tokyo District Court convicted the couple of five murders and sentenced them to eight and four years in prison, respectively. Both parties appealed, but the Supreme Court of Japan rejected the appeal on September 15, 1953. So, beauty on the outside doesn't always equate to beauty on the inside. 
If you enjoyed this video, be sure to explore our channel for more equally captivating content.